Good evening, church. Let's all stand. Page 403. 403 isn't the love. There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine, love that brought him from the realms of glory, just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful? it is to me boundless as the universe around me reaching to the farthest soul away saving keeping love it was that found me that is why my heart can truly say isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful wonderful something wonderful wonderful it is to me love beyond our human comprehending love of god in christ how can it be this will be my theme and never ending great redeeming love of calvary isn't the love of jesus something wonderful Wonderful, wonderful, oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to me. Amen. You may be seated. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for allowing us to be here in your house this evening, Lord. We pray, God, that you would uh, just please be with the service, Lord, be with the time of prayer that we're going to have, Lord, and be with the Bible study. God, we pray, Lord, that you would be with those who could not make it out here tonight, Lord. We pray, God, that you please put a special hedge of protection around them, Lord. And God, we just pray, Lord, that you would meet the needs represented here tonight, Lord. There's people that are grieving. There are people that are that need strength, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would please uh, meet those individual needs. Thank you for being a great father to us, a loving father. And God, we just pray, Lord, that you would please uh, have your hand over the service. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.
came up here without my order. 277, Jesus loves even me. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Amen. And our last song, 258, 258, Oh, How I Love Jesus. There is a name I love to sing. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first, on the last verse, it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears apart that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Amen. Who's that singing? That sounds so good. Um, Valentine's Banquet is February 17th. That's a Saturday. We're going to be meeting over at the Magianos there in Cherry Hill at 1230. And um, we're looking forward to spending some time there. And then Bake Sale, February 24th, uh, here at the church. 
Um, right after the Sunday morning service, the teens will be having a bake sale, and all proceeds will go toward their trip to nowhere. So just a reminder to uh, make sure you bring some cash in for that day, uh, February 24th. And then Missions Emphasis Weekend will be February 23rd through the 25th. We'll have a service on Friday the uh, 23rd um, at 6 o'clock. We're uh, going to be meeting here and then breaking um, down for the uh, Scripture Assembly Project that will start off on Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning with breakfast. And then we're looking forward just to the Sunday services. All, this, all the service times will remain uh, the same. And uh, we're looking forward to the different speakers that we'll have that week. Uh, teen Trip to Nowhere will be February 29th through March 2nd. And the cost for that is $150, $150, which includes lodging, meals, and activities. And prior to the trip, the teens will receive a list of items they will need. And for any questions um, or information and details, you can reach out to Sammy. And that's coming up February 29th through March 2nd. Be in prayer for that. And uh, ladies' Bible study, the first three Tuesdays in March, adult ladies are welcome to attend a three-week study on living loved. And they'll be meeting over at Missy Woodrum's house. And that will start at 6.30 p.m., the uh, first three Tuesdays in March. And they're encouraging carpooling uh, due to limited parking. And there's a sign-up sheet on the baptistry, so please make sure you sign up so um, they have a head count for that. That is it for announcements. If you brought an offering here this evening, we have our offering box on the back wall there, or you can give online through our website. Let's pray for the offering. Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. Thank you, God, for this opportunity, Lord, that we can worship you through our tithes and our offerings, Lord. I pray, God, that you would just continue to meet the needs of the church, Lord. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness. And God, we just pray, Lord, that you would just uh, be with the rest of the service, be with the preaching of your word. God, I pray that you would open our hearts to it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, we're going to be in Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. As soon as we get done with the book of Acts, um, we're not really studying the book of Acts. We're studying the life of Paul. We're going to move on, and we're kind of going chronologically through his life. And um, prior to Acts 27, he had written First and Second he, Galatians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Corinthians, and Romans, which we've already covered. And now we're we're coming up to the time that he's in Rome, and he's. Um, shipwreck, you know, after a shipwreck, he's going to be in Rome, and uh, he's going to be in prison there in Rome, and we're going, to, we're going to do the prison epistles. We're just going to, you know, go through the prison epistles, which is Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, and then after that, we'll go into the uh, pastoral epistles, and then we'll, we'll finish up with the book of Hebrews, which I believe was written by Paul, but, you know, some debate that, but it's definitely Pauline, but we'll tie it in with this study. So as we read these um, concluding two chapters, as we go through these concluding two chapters of the book of Acts, um, the prisoner, remember Paul was a prisoner, um, is finally on his way by ship to Rome, and he's going to appeal his case before Nero. You remember he, he, he said, I, you know, uh, I, I appeal to Caesar, and uh, because he was afraid he was going to get uh, assassinated, really. They were trying to bring him back to Jerusalem to try his case there, and so he appeals to uh, to Caesar, and, um, you know, Caesar's going to have to hear his case. And, you know, I always wondered if um, he actually ever did appear before Caesar, but the Lord tells him in this passage that we're going to look at today that he's going to appear before Caesar, and, and, and because if the Lord says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. So he actually did uh, uh, you know, meet Caesar, and I, we believe that the um, the case was dropped. Now, this is Nero, or it's a little bit debated whether this was Nero or the one that preceded him. And Nero, as we know, is uh, the guy that's going to have him put to death uh, about eight years later. Um, he's going to have him beheaded. But um, they say that Nero, in the earlier part of his reign, he wasn't that bad. He wasn't. He progressively got worse as time went on. And so, but Paul had been taken into custody after being accused by the religious leaders in Jerusalem of bringing a Gentile into the temple. 
He pled his case to Governor Felix and then Governor Festus and to King Agrippa to no avail. And now, after two years in Caesarea, he is finally going to Rome, hopeful uh, to get the justice he seeks. Now, uh, I have a map. We're, we're going to kind of pull that up as time goes on. You might as well just leave it up there, Wade. You don't even put the points up there. Just leave that map up there, and they can maybe uh, trace along because a lot of this in Chapter 27 is going to be different places that Paul travels to on his way. And so in verses 1 through 3, we see Paul's companions, and he names some people that are with him on this journey. So in uh, Chapter 27 of verse 1, it says, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. And um, Augustus's band, you know, these were Caesar's special guards. And so Paul would be chained to a praetorian guard the whole time he was under house arrest there in, in Rome. And this guard was going to accompany him the whole way from Caesarea up to Rome. And entering into a ship of Adramidium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh him. So you'll note from verse 1 that there were other people along with the Apostle Paul. Obviously, there were a lot of people on this ship. These ships were... They were not, you know, it wasn't just like an Uber that, you know, they, they, they got to take them somewhere. I mean, these ships were already commercial vessels that were traveling all over the place. And there were smaller ships. Some of the smaller ships would hug the coast and go from port to port to port. And then some of the larger ships would go directly across the Mediterranean Sea. And so this first uh, uh, ship was probably a smaller ship because the, the route they take kind of hugs the coast. And, um, but he had other people with him. And, um, you know, these men that were there with him, um, you know, they were, uh, they were men that were, you know, very close to Paul and, uh, they were trying to help him any way they could. And so there were other prisoners along with Paul as well. Um, the word other, though, in this text means another of a different kind or classification. So these men were not men associated with Paul. And they may have been men that were sentenced to be put to death at Rome. And how fortunate for them, if you think about it, that Paul was traveling with them. And it's kind of like the two thieves on the cross. I mean, they had a tremendous opportunity. You know, they were, they were put on the cross when Jesus was put on the cross. And so only one of them got saved, but both of them had the opportunity to receive Christ as Savior, and all of the people on this ship had a tremendous opportunity as well because Paul was with them. And so they were very fortunate to be traveling with Paul. But also we know that there were some others on there. We know that Luke was there, and you see the word we and the word us in there, and that means the writer is included. Sometimes in the book of Acts, it doesn't use we or us. It says they. But here it says we, which means Luke was part of this. And uh, perhaps the Roman officials permitted Luke to go along with Paul as his personal physician. And again, Luke, uh, Paul wasn't a, a troublemaker. He wasn't a problem prisoner. And so he was granted a lot of liberty along the way. It's kind of like Joseph in the prison. You know, I mean, Joseph was with Potiphar at first, and, and Potiphar gave him special treatment. And then he went to prison and in Pharaoh's prison in, underneath uh, the, the palace there in, in Egypt. And, and um, he had special, you know, uh, privileges by the prison guards. And uh, so it was a similar situation here. And then it mentions Julius, and Julius is a centurion that was responsible, you know, he was one of the centurions that was uh, responsible for protecting Nero, and he treated Paul well, he gave him liberty, and when others wanted to kill the prisoners, he's the guy later on in this passage, he protects Paul, he said, all right, listen, we're going to, you know, the, during the shipwreck, they're all going to be jumping off the ship and swim in the land, and they were afraid they were going to lose the prisoners, so the, the other soldiers said, well, let's kill all the prisoners then. And uh, this guy said, no, let's not do it, he, he, you know, because he didn't want to see Paul put to death. And then the other name that's mentioned there is Aristarchus. And we first meet him back in Acts chapter 19, where the citizens of Ephesus are kind of roughing him up during a riot. 
Uh, that's back in Acts 19 and verse 29. He travels back to Jerusalem with Paul at the conclusion of the third journey, and he apparently he stayed close to him as Paul was incarcerated in Caesarea. So he's kind of following Paul around wherever Paul goes. And Paul refers to him in Colossians as his fellow prisoner, and in Philemon, he refers to him as his fellow laborer. And so these guys were, um, well, I wouldn't say Julius was close to him, but Luke and Aristarchus were both very close to Paul. And there were also many others with Paul on the two ships that he would travel on. And we don't know how many sailors and passengers were with Paul on that first ship, this ship that was from Adramidium. And by the way, that, you can see that up on the map somewhere. It's up there where you see the word Asia above that. If you have good eyes, you can see there's a big, long word begins with an A. I can make out the A, and uh, that's a Andromidium. Now, he didn't go to Andromidium, but the boat was from there. And you know, like boats, they have the colors. They have a flag, and they're, they're out of certain places. Well, that ship was out of Andromidium, and, um, and that was going to take him as far as Myra, where Paul would then change ships. Um, and on that second ship, that, that ship from Alexandria that he gets on, there are 276 men on that ship. So he's got a lot of people that are traveling with him, and a lot of people get saved as a result of this trip with Paul. Now, just some practical thoughts about that. It appears that Luke and Aristarchus were both voluntarily giving their lives in service to the Lord by serving with the Apostle Paul. And um, these are the only two that are mentioned traveling with him, by name anyway, uh, which could mean that Paul was forsaken by some of his fair-weather friends when he got arrested. You know, that always happens. You go through a little bit of a downtime or you go through a period of, uh, you know, problems or whatever, and, and you lose some of your friends. And uh, it's always sad that that happens, but it happens. I, I was talking to a um, pastor up in Connecticut, um, and he went through a you know, family problem, as every pastor goes through family problems, and he went through a family problem, and, and a couple of his pharisaical preacher friends just dropped him. I mean, just, you know, they, 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 you shouldn't be in the ministry, all this kind of stuff, and, and they just dropped him, and no compassion. And, um, but, you know, it's interesting, it's several years after this family problem that he had, and, and um, you know, God turned the whole thing around. His ministry's doing great. His family's doing great. And, um, and so, and all these other guys, I, I wonder how they're doing, the ones that, that had no compassion. But Paul had some people that were with him, but then now they're not with him. And, and, you know, we can't assume, I guess, but we just wonder what happened to these people. But Aristarchus and Luke are still with them. And uh, so these two men were willing to serve under the apostle Paul as second men. And they sacrificed greatly in their service. And keep in mind that Luke, you know, as far as the world standards were concerned, was a much more, you know, prominent citizen. He was a physician, a doctor. He was well-educated. Uh, they say the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Acts is a masterpiece in Greek literature. Matter of fact, the book of Hebrews, they say, is a masterpiece in Greek literature, which caused some to doubt that it was written by Paul. I think it was written by Paul in Hebrew, and then Luke translated it for him because it was all written right around the same time. Uh, but I don't know that for sure, but I'm just saying it's a masterpiece. It's well edu It's written by somebody who's very, very well educated. And um, so uh, they sacrificed their position in the world so that they could, they could serve the Apostle Paul uh, and, and serve the Lord by serving the Apostle Paul. And uh, so there must have been something special in the Apostle Paul to inspire this kind of level of loyalty, dedication, and service from these two men. And even the centurion eventually becomes a good friend to the Apostle Paul. And, uh, you know, as I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, good friends are just, they're hard to come by. Um, you, 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 if you get a handful of really, really good lifetime friends, uh, you're a very fortunate person. Uh, the Bible says, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And in my case, that's, that's pretty good because my brothers stick pretty close to me. I have brothers that are, I'm very close to, and, uh, but I have some very close friends as well. And the Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. And these guys laid down their lives for the Lord, but they also laid down their lives for the apostle Paul. And though they didn't die... In this shipwreck, because nobody lost their lives in this shipwreck that's coming up, they were willing 
to lay down their lives. And so Paul had some really good friends that hazarded their lives for him, uh, but Paul must have been a good friend to them as well. And so, um, you know, we need to be a friend, but it's good to have friends. And Paul had some people, though he was in a downtime, I mean, he went through two years in Caesarea, two years in Rome, the, you know, the travel by ship and everything. So it's five years of incarceration, and he's just, he's in a downtime. And, uh, but he had some friends that really stuck close to him. And so it's a blessing to have good friends. And so in, uh, secondly here in verses 4 down through verse 19, we see Paul's course. How, where did he go? How did he get there? How did he get to Rome? And uh, first of all, he was on this ship we learned earlier in the text from Andromidium, but verses 4 and 5 give us the course on that particular ship. And we, when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus. Notice that, and you can follow along on that map. If uh, Mr. Wade will put it back up again, just leave the map up. Everybody can follow along in their Bibles, Mr. Wade, and uh, they can just put the map back up. Um, and um, and so uh, where are we at here? And and when he had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there's two Lycias. One they're they're spelled differently. Lycia is the big one. Uh, you see where Galatia and Asia are. Underneath that, you see Lycia. It's a region. And Myra is that little dot, that little city that's there. And then there's another Lycia. It's spelled a little bit differently. It's underneath Crete. And, um, and so that was another place he would travel to. And so that was on that ship of, uh, of Andromidium. And then in verse 6, he switches ships. He goes on a ship to uh, a ship that was from Alexandria. So in verse 6, and there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and, um, and he put us therein. And so this ship from Egypt, Alexandria in Egypt, was a larger vessel, and it was carrying grain, and it had many more sailors and passengers. Verse 7, and when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Snidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone, and hardly passing it came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto the city of Lycia, another Lycia. And um, now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. And by the way, the fast that he's referring to there refers to that yearly fast at the Day of Atonement, and that occurred at the end of September, early October. Uh, it's the month in the Jewish calendar. It's the month Tizri, and, um, and the seas were very dangerous in the late fall and early winter months, and uh, so they really should have just stopped there and wintered, but they decided they want to go a little bit further, and um, so notice what happens next. And said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of, of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion, Julius, he believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And so he didn't listen to Paul. You know, he doesn't know Paul that well. He's going to get to know Paul very well, and he's going to listen to everything Paul says. Matter of fact, uh, Paul's going to, you know, uh, tell them that, uh, you know, he's going to tell them to get rid of everything off the ship and, and they're going to do exactly what Paul tells them to do um, in a little bit here. Verse 12, and because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phenice and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And notice this, and when the south winds blew softly, so they figured, oh, okay, well, we're, we're okay. Uh, supposing that they had obtained their purpose loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. Man, the winds are good. Everything's good. We're going we're gonna to take off. You know, uh, lift up the anchors. We're going we're gonna to set out to sea. But not long, not long after, there arose against it. Notice this. You got two words here. You got the word tempestuous wind, and then it says called Eurocladin. 
And the word tempestuous is the word that we get the word typhoon from. It's typhonicus. And uh, we get the word typhoon from us. And Eurocliton is a south, uh, southeast wind causing mighty waves. And so you got these two words that are just synonymous with really, really, really bad storms. And by the way, um, you know, just when you think the seas are going to be calm, you know, it says the south wind blew softly. And, uh, you know, the winds are going to be soft. A violent storm can suddenly come upon you. And so try not to be caught by surprise. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And uh, notice also that this ship would, have, would not have been caught in this storm at all had they listened to God's messenger who warned them against leaving the port in the fair havens. Notice also that Paul had... He didn't have a concrete message. It wasn't a thus saith the Lord. It's not like the Lord appeared to him and said he just had a bad feeling about this uh, impending storm. But instead of them trusting God's man, they went with the advice of the experts, the ship owner, and it turned out to be a disaster for them. And um, listen, God oversees the weather. God allowed them to go out into the stormy seas. And if God brings you into it, he can bring you through it. And um, so anyway, but they end up going through a really bad situation here. And so uh, in verse 15, and when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, strake sail, and so were driven. And we, being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day, notice this, they lightened the ship. And the third day, we cast out with our own hands, notice this, the tackling of the ship. And the tackling really has got to do with any kind of equipment or even furniture. They just threw it overboard. Can you imagine how frustrating that would be if you were the owner of the ship and you start throwing all your equipment and stuff overboard? Anything unnecessary, you just get rid of it. And eventually, you're going to be throwing the grain overboard. And that's the whole reason why they're, they're sailing is to bring this grain. And um, so thirdly, then, we see Paul's counsel. Now, we already saw Paul's counsel back in verse 10 and 11. He said, listen, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out if I were you. I just have a bad feeling about this. Uh, but then we see more counsel in verse 20. Notice he says there, and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. These people are, they're scared to death. Be of good cheer, uh, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me, notice this, this night, the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. So notice it, according to the angel of the Lord here, God was not only going to save Paul, but he was going to save all those that were traveling with him. By the way, you know, sometimes the people that are with the Christian that's inside the will of God, they, 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 they receive the residual blessings. i never forget when I was at um, Texas Diecast and I got into uh, a little bit of a, a scuffle with my foreman one time because he was trying to get me to stay. You know, I worked every bit of overtime he would give me because I very frankly, because I needed the money desperately. And sometimes I was working 65, 70 hours a week at this diecast factory. But he wanted me to work. Um, he wanted me to work. He, I, I had to leave because it was Sunday morning, and I had a bus route up in Texarkana. And I said, listen, I got to go. I can't stay any longer. And it was already extra. It was already overtime. It wasn't my normal schedule. And he said this to me. He said, Texas diecast feeds your family. And boy, that just, that just set me off. <laughs> And I, said, I poked him in his chest. I said, listen, pal, let me, you better get this straight. I said, God feeds my family, and God happens to be using Texas Diecast right now to provide that. But if you want to push this thing, I'll just walk out of here and never come back, and God will feed my family another way. I said, but let me just tell you this. God is blessing you 
And this place, because there's a number of us from the college that are working here, and, uh, you know, this place is prospering, and you're providing employment. But, you know, even the lost world receives residual blessings from the Christian who's inside. Your workplace is a blessed place because you're there. Your home is a blessed place, even if there's unbelievers that live there. That's what Paul said when he said, elsewhere your children are unclean. It's set apart. It's sanctified because you live there. And, um, and so, so God was going to save all that traveled with him. And notice what it says there in that verse, in verse 24. It says, it says, God hath given thee. And so this must have been a prayer request of Paul. Think about it. He's given thee. He's, he's giving Paul what he asked for. Paul must have been praying, not just God save me, you know, I don't care if everybody else dies, but save me in this shipwreck. But he must have been praying for his fellow passengers, and God answered that prayer. And uh, Paul was not really, I don't think, concerned so much about their physical lives. He was concerned about their spiritual destinies. He knew that most of these men were lost. And if they died there in that shipwreck, they were going to end up in hell forever. And he wanted an opportunity to be able to reach them with the gospel, and he'll get that opportunity as well. So now look at verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. And that's one of the greatest lines in the Bible. For I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. I hope you believe what God says, hearing God's word. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. So he's really predicting everything that's going to happen. And that's that island of Malta or Melita. Sometimes it's in the Bible, it's called Melita. It's on your map, it's called Malta. And uh, we'll see they end up there. But when the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. Now, notice that word Adria, by the way. If you look at that map up there, um, you see where it says Ionian Sea in between Macedonia and the boot of Italy? Uh, it, Wade, can you pull that map down a little bit? If you go above the boot heel... You know where I'm talking about the boot heel? I don't know if Wade can pull that down or not. But it says C up at the top. Well, that's actually called the Adriatic Sea. So really that area is both the Adriatic Sea and the Ionian Sea. And so, but people called the, the waters between Italy and Greece, they called it Adria. And so they really, I mean, technically he's not up in the Adriatic Sea as we would know it today. But um, anyway, that's the, that's the area that is being referred to there. And, um, and so look at verse 28. And sounded, and sounding meaning they're trying to find out how deep the water is, and found it 20 fathoms. When they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. And by, the, by the way, that's, uh, I think, what the name Mark Twain means, isn't it? Isn't it like six fathoms deep or something like that? Six fathoms, is, that's where he got that name from. He worked as a steamship captain on the Mississippi. Uh, not a captain, a steamship worker on the Mississippi, but six fathoms. And, uh, but a fathom is six feet, so 20 fathoms would have been 120 feet. 15 fathoms would have been 90 feet. So the more they travel, uh, the more shallow it's getting. And if you're in a boat, you really don't want... Um, a ship anyway, a, you know, a big ship like that, you definitely don't want to be in shallow water. Then fearing, verse 29, um, fearing lest we, sh we, we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And, um, you know, we don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds, you know, you know what it means is what, just what it sounds like. They hope for the best, you know, like they say, okay, we're going to do this, and we're, we're hoping it works. And uh, verse 30, and as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, and that phrase under color means for the purpose of or for the reason of, for the reason as though they would have cast anchors out of the ship, Paul said, to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Notice that. He, he, he tells them, listen, you've got to stay in the ship. You can't. If you go out in that boat, you're going to die. Um, but if you stay in the ship, you're going to make it. Then the soldiers, notice they listened to him. They cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. So they didn't jump in their lifeboat. That's, that's, you're listening now. You're paying attention to what Paul is saying. 
And um, look at uh, verse 33 through 36. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, to eat something, saying, the day, this day is the 14th day that you have tarried and, and continued fasting and having uh, taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Notice he got an allusion to the Lord's Supper there. Um, then were they all of good cheer, and they all took some meat. And Paul, you know, he encourages them because they need physical strength for what they're about to do. And, um, and so look at um, verse 37. And we were in all in the ship 200, uh, 203 score and 16 souls. So 276 souls were on that boat. And by the way, that's what they do on ships. They call them souls. Uh, the planes, too, they call them souls. They, when they're numbering how many souls were on board, they call them souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship. And this is where Paul becomes a castaway. Uh, uh, when they had eaten up, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded if it were possible to thrust in the ship. So they were trying to find this, this little harbor that they could bring the ship in. Hopefully it was deep enough they can get the ship in there and they can get away from this storm. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder band and hoist up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore and falling into a place where two seas met. They ran the ship aground and the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. Now notice this, and the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim out and escape, but the centurion willing to save Paul kept them from their purpose. So notice, Paul, just being there, saved all these other prisoners' lives, kept them from their purpose, and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, notice this, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. So Paul's a castaway. And um, so you see God's hand of protection on the, the apostle Paul, and, um, and you also see the help of this new friend, the centurion. And, uh, you know, God had told Paul that he was going to Rome and nothing was going to change that. And so you just got to trust God. If God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. And Paul knew he was going to go to Rome. And Paul was confident that God was going to protect him. And in verse 25, Paul stated that he believed God. Um, in 1 Chronicles 28, 20, um, David was encouraging Solomon. And uh, he said this, he, he said to Solomon, be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed for the Lord God, even my God will be with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. So God's plan for Solomon was to build the temple and he was going to be around and he was invincible until he finished what the Lord had for him to do. And Paul was going to go to Rome and he didn't know, he said he was going to send him far hence to the Gentiles. But here the angel of God says, you're going to appear before Caesar. So he's going to get there. And he knew he was invincible. Nothing was going to change that. And, uh, but also God assured him that he was going to save the rest of them as well. Notice real quick, and we're, we're done with this, but you notice the broken boards and broken pieces. Some of you know Brother Riplog's song, um, you know, some on broken boards, some on broken pieces. And, um, you know, he, he used to preach that message back in Longview. We were good friends with him. And uh, he preached the message based on that song. I actually, he wrote the song based on the message. And, uh, you know, the message basically went that all of us are kind of broken boards and broken pieces. I don't think there's a one of us in this room that's in God's plan A for your life. You know, we haven't, you know, bounced out of the will of God somewhere along the way or diverted off the path somehow. So we're all, in a sense, broken boards and broken pieces. And we may not, you know, those boards were originally intended to be used to, to be part of that ship. Well, now they're going to be used for a completely different purpose. And God can do that with us, too. You know, we're, we're not perfect. We're not exactly what we were per perhaps intended to be uh, back or what we could have been if we stayed inside the perfect will of God the whole time. 
And uh, so we're all, in a sense, broken boards and broken pieces. But God uses broken boards and broken pieces to help save other people. And that's what he did with those broken boards and broken pieces. And they clung to them and they ended up on shore. It's just an illustration, an illusion, a picture, if you will. But I think it's profound and I think it's very true. God uses us even though, you know, we're not, you know, in, in the perfect place where, where God originally intended us to be. And so you may be broken. You may have blown it in the past. You may have failed in the past. You may not be in God's plan A for your life anymore, but God can still use you to rescue other people who have just been shipwrecked as well. And so, anyway, we'll stop there, um, and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your word, and thank you that even though we, through these historical passages like Acts, we can go through them pretty quickly, but the Bible is just so plain. The truth is just there. And uh, there's really nothing deep, mysterious, and hidden in these passages. And we can just really read them. And um, and I don't know why people try to say that the Bible's difficult. That's all very, very plain reading. And so we're thankful for the example that we have from these these historical passages of Scripture and also from the principles that we can pull out of them. And we pray, God, that you would help us to trust you like Paul trusted you and help us to exude the confidence that you give us to other people to calm their lives as well. Uh, Other people are very anxious, um, and uh, they're very uh, worried and scared. And uh, if we're worried and scared and anxious, we're going to just make them worse. But God, through the peace with God and the peace of God that you give us, we can exude that peace, and we can help other people to have peace as well. And Paul's presence on that ship, I believe, saved the lives of all those other people. But not only that, it was a blessing to them. It was an encouragement to them. It was a strength to them. And uh, though there were leaders there, uh, the owner of the ship and the Roman soldiers, they were all the leaders there, uh, Paul ended up being the real leader of that whole journey. And uh, so we're so thankful for that example. Help us to lead spiritually. Help us to Uh, be that kind of leader in life where people look to us for spiritual guidance and encouragement and strength during difficult days. We pray you bless. Give us all safety as we travel home. Bless the deacons meeting that we're going to have. And uh, Lord, we just pray you'd be with uh, all these final touches that are going in uh, to the building. We're just so close uh, to getting it done. And we're thankful for that. And we just pray you continue to bless. Bless the rest of our week now. Help us to be good ambassadors for you. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. To a little country church outside of